you very much, Vice-Chancellor. I'm really glad to be here and grateful to have been invited. Um, I was actually last in this region in 1969 when I drove in an old van from Cambridge to the Himalayas via Delhi. So I dro drove down the Grand Trunk Road through Punjab and through Haryana and what I saw then was an incredibly rich and fertile region. It was the third year of the Green Revolution. There were huge piles of wheat beside the Grand Trunk Road under the trees because they hadn't invested in storage. Nobody had predicted that the yields and the productivity would be as they were. And as we drove through the market towns, I was absolutely astonished at the drama being enacted in the marketplaces with great fat merchants with diamond rings and silk kurtas sitting there and spindly laborers laboring underneath what looked like 100 kilos sacks of, of wheat. And it was that experience of driving through Punjab and Haryana which has actually set me off for the rest of my life, being interested in firstly grain markets and looking at distributive policies of the Green Revolution and then looking at markets in general in India and then the informal economy. So I feel that this afternoon really quite moved because I've come a whole 360 degrees, 40, 40, 43 years later, back to where it all began for me and back to something which is also a visionary project. And I wish you all uh, enormously well in developing these courses at this extraordinary campus. Okay, so my lecture is public policy through the lens of a number of disciplines. What's the problem? The problem is that development policy, I mean, all of you are engaged in, uh, in political advocacy, advocacy, the analysis of policy um, through different disciplines, and I am approaching it through development, the particular bundle of policies. It's a huge agenda which constitute development policy. Development policy is normally presented as rational, depoliticized, and inevitable. The problem is that, in fact, it's pervaded with power relations, it's very costly, and it's heavily politically contested. In development policy, emphasis is placed on the disc discursive realm um, to the detriment of an understanding of implementation. And this is a big general problem. There's a very interesting article on the on the net by a guy called Larry Lohman called um, Climate Crisis, Social Science Crisis, which is looking at um, climate change and the failure of global deals and the failure to reduce CO2 um, and examining all the explanations for this, sort of political cycles being short term, international law being weak, the tendency to free ride, and the fact that politicians ignore science. And his conclusion is that this is not enough and that we need to factor in the importance of American policy advocacy, in particular the American fixation on cap and trade, and the inability of the American policy agenda to deal with banning things or even taxing, that the policy agenda has to be formulated through markets. So his idea is that policy science is in crisis, just like climate uh, policy is in crisis, social science is in a big crisis, because we don't have the tools to study real markets, real states, and actually existing policy making. Policy and policy advice is trapped in disciplines and in paradigms. And what I want to do is to examine how disciplines see policy in various ways, and we will see that disciplines overlap in their understanding of policy, but they're also that there are huge divergences and gulfs. And the talk can't possibly be exhaustive. It might exhaust me and you, but it won't be exhaustive. It'll just be suggestive of some of the richness of, richness of approaches which are available in various disciplines, economics, politics, anthropology, public administration, and the sociology of law. So I hope to just sort of whip through these five disciplines. Um, and when all these approaches are put together, it's then no longer possible to think about policy innocently, just as other scholars have attempted to do this with markets and with exchange. Policy, as you see, is 
um, variously defined as actions or principles. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary gives policy as a course of action adopted by a government. And Bernard Schaffer, who was a huge influence on me when I started um, a, a, a authoritative researcher in public administration, um, concluded that policy is what it does. Whereas Richard Tismus, the sociologist, uh, defined policy as the principles which govern action directed toward a, a given end. And I've been at a whole series of climate change conferences over the last two years and heard Sir Crispin Tickle, who is credited with uh, persuading Margaret Thatcher of the importance of climate change, stand up in his 80s and say, we are all at sea without navigation instruments, which is suggestive of the big problem that, um, that, that policy poses um, in terms not just of understanding it and teaching it and uh, en enga engaging in policy analysis, but also doing something about real world problems. Um, and, my, and the hope of this, um, this talk is, is, is to encourage everybody to be self-aware in policy analysis, but also in policy advocacy. Many of you are going out into the world to be activists of various sorts, to be engaged in formulating or deciding or, or implementing policy. And my own feeling is that it's not possible to do that innocently. One needs to understand, have a very, very good understanding of where one's own ideas are coming from, what one won't do, and why one won't do it. OK. Um, I want to start with economics. Economics approach... Some are almost embarrassed after the financial crisis to, you know, <laughs> confess that they are an economist. No, well, I want, <laughs> what I want to do is to... <laughs> to celebrate the, the contributions of economics to, to our understanding of policy, because certainly in the study of development, economics is the hegemonic social science. Um, now, economics approaches policy in many different ways. The first is as a residual, as a policy implication. In so many economics papers, a problem is rigorously set up in terms of a mathematical logic. It's the, it then slips slightly because it has to be investigated in relation to the availability of data, it is then analyzed, generally presented as though something is validated rather than truly tested. And then something at the end happens, which is called policy implications. Um, and what, what's missing from that is any sense of the costs of making policy, of the costs of the policy process itself, the resources, which are intellectual, manpower resources, technological resources, financial resources. Um, Nicholas Stern, in the Stern report on climate change, which went whizzing around the world, um, showed that not doing anything about climate change was going to cost, if you waited in poverty and you, um, you added feedback effects into his model, it was going to cost something up to 25% of GDP. That's a huge, huge amount. Um, in, I think it was by 2050, unless something was done about it. And he's unusual in that uh, he get, came down to this magic number of 1%. If you spend 1% of GDP now, you will save having to shell out 25% uh, in 2050. And he's unusual in having tried to cost activity which averts a future um, policy threat. But he didn't cost policy in the sense that I'm talking about. He didn't cost um, the, the, the actual administrative costs of of uh, the kinds of actions, the new carbon markets and the new markets for technology that he ended up advocating in a residual way. So his is a very good example of that kind of analysis. I mean, I think it's excellent of its kind and it also exemplify, exemplifies the problems of it. The second way economists approach policy is as a challenge, a design problem. Um, economists have a whole slew of analytical tools to pull levers and answer the politician's question or the bureaucrat's question. If I pull this lever, if I do this, if I liberalize trade, if I reduce tariffs, what will happen to the rest of the economy? And uh, through systems of equations, the economist can give a, a, a diagnostic answer, a, a, a sort of parametric answer. Economists don't do well when they use it to predict but basically their tools enable us to think in dimensions which are much more complicated than our own brains. So uh, the computable general equilibrium model, which is the sort of prototype of the, or the, uh, the well-designed social cost-benefit analysis, these are tools to answer a very important question which bureaucrats and politicians 
have been empowered now these days to ask. If they ask that question, no other discipline can provide the answer. Okay. Um, and, and a fairly accessible example of thinking about policy in terms of a design problem is Arvind Panagaria's paper published by the NCAAR very, just down the road in 2009. And it's on climate change and it's on the global and the Indian solution of carbon markets. And the structure of the argument is for the status quo. The structure of the argument goes that um, emissions taxes and carbon markets are substitutable. But taxes distort prices and therefore their effect is on consumer demand and carbon markets fix the quantity and the price by capping quantities administratively and the prices follow. And that if the price for carbon is high, it'll be an incentive to innovate and that will be a direct track to the producer. Now, this simplifies, if you follow the structure of the argument, it simplifies the policy options to two, taxes and carbon markets. And it's argued through principle rather than practice. And that argument ignores the practices of special pleading, which the European Union, for instance, is very, is very vulnerable to. It ignores the lobbying, which is characteristic of all carbon markets. It ignores the transactions costs of monitoring, the costs of lack of enforcement, and the absence of punishment. And it also ignores all the politics of inventing the counterfactuals, which India will know through the carbon clean development mechanism. All that is kind of reluctantly admitted. Again, right at the end, it's residualized. It's admitted at the end, once the uh, design problem has been simplified and addressed in in that way. Then economists will look at policy um, reduced to an indicator in a regression analysis approach to a problem. There's a very good example by um, Tim Bessley and Robin Burgess on political agency, government response, and the role of the media. This is, an ex this is not a climate change policy thing. This is a food policy famine case study. Um, but politics is reduced to a dummy. It's either one or it's zero in a system of equa equations. And even when it's significant, it leaves us kind of wondering at the end what it is about the dummy that actually causes the effect that's proved to be significant. What is it about democracy or about certain kinds of elections? In other words, what the economist has to do to in include policy in this kind of an analysis um, with, uh, where the question was, what is the role of the media in famine response? In, uh, uh, it, sorry, excuse me, I'll put that another way. What is the role of democracy in famine response? Um, in the end, we're left with more questions than answers. We know that something is significant, it's reduced to an indicator, do, on or off. Um, but we're not actually very much wiser about what it is that has enabled uh, a quicker response to a food security disaster. The last very, very important way uh, in which economists help the study of policy is in a mass of applied evaluations. And here, the economist contribution overlaps with the public administration contribution, um, which I'll go on to in the next slide. Um, this is a, tool, a set of tools which economics can marshal for a rational and linear conception of policy. And it's very important. If we were all taken up in a plane and we were dropped with parachutes in various parts of, say, a new continent like Africa and told that we had six weeks in order to figure out what the big policy problems were, we would have to use a linear, rational conception of policy because there is no alternative. It's a way in which we start out. And in this approach, economists have two contributions. Um, the policy problem is generally couched as a problem and a deficit, something is lacking, malnutrition or good governance, what we were talking about this morning. Um, data is then brought to bear on this problem in order to do one of two things. One is to set a, a limited number of choices again uh, and to cost the benefits due to different policies um, in their stream of benefits uh, into the future and to reduce them to costs in the present to enable a comparative uh, exercise to take place and a choice of the best, most beneficial policy. Or, much more frequently, a TINA approach, there is no alternative, uh, one policy selected and carefully costed by economists. 
for a policy process called decision making, after which we have something quite different, which is called implementation, which is not much studied by economists, except when governments have the resources and the interest to engage in monitoring and evaluation, which is very costly. But at which point, where an economist does step in and carry out monitoring and evaluation, again, we can see this instead of a straight line, rational linear approach to policy, we can see it as a sort of circle where monitoring, monitoring and evaluation forms the feedback loop to another round of uh, problem identification, um, data assembling, decision making and implementation. Okay, so many roles for economists in the standard public administration approach to the policy sector. About this, there are a number of features um, w which receive a great deal of comment in the literature. The first is labelling, and some people also call it sectorisation. Nothing can happen without labels. Uh, I'm not certainly ever going to make an, a, a, a case for not labelling things. It's completely inevitable. But let me give you an example. Nutrition policy. When I, in the 1980s, I taught in a medical school, and uh, I taught doctors who'd stepped off the hospital ladder and were studying nutrition. Now, nutrition policy turned out to be a policy subfield. It consisted of surveillance, mother and child feeding, <coughs> um, school meals, and food fortification. It did not consist of alcohol. Even though when we go out into villages and study nutrition and food security, we discover that amongst households that are food insecure, the alcohol consumption of the household head represents a sum of money, which if we could via magically and turn into sorghum or a cheap form of calories, would probably reduce the deficit of a food scarce household almost completely. But alcohol is not nutrition policy and neither is agriculture. And when we come to agriculture and we look freely without sort of theoretical blinkers at agricultural policy, we find that almost every ministry of the Indian state, in the central state and the state state, in the provinces, have activities which have a bearing on agriculture. And when we look at energy, okay, there's a ministry for energy. There's also a ministry for mines, and of course one of the biggest energy fields is coal. Um, and that minister, there are also departments and bureaus. There's a ministry of environment. There's a ministry of new and renewable energy. Do you get my drift? Sectoralization means that um, uh, we actually externalize things which may have huge impacts on the field that we're studying. In other words, non-sectoral policy may well overwhelm sectoral policy. A second thing about which much is written is our escape hatches in policy, in the policy process and this, this linear view of uh, policy. What do I mean? I mean institutionalized irresponsibility. Um, this can be practical and institutionalized, as when um, tactics such as devolution or compartmentalizing things or expertization, I hope that you all, um, this is ringing bells in everybody's heads, um, office procedure, uh, department regulations and federalization, all these devices are ways of organizing um, the implementation of policy in a way which means that people can escape responsibility for what happens in implementation. There are also presentational tactics like spin, like there is no alternative, which is one of the commonest um, aspects of spin, like the ubiquity of scarcity, scarcity in every form. Once you see it, you see policy documents absolutely laden with a burden of scarcity. And um, the shifting of blame to leakages of various sorts, the invocation of political will, which I'm allergic to. I think you need to replace political will by political interest wherever possible. And then operating routines, which also shift or disguise responsibility, like protocols, which we can't do without, but many protocols have this effect, or control over administration. So there are actually in organograms of, of, of the, act, the existing state, there are modes and practices of shifting of responsibility downwards, but also resistance to it and try attempts to shift it back upwards. So we have one metaphor, which is escape hatches, but we might well see it as a battleground where, where various um, levels of the hierarchy of government 
try to escape responsibility for um, the serious mishaps that happen in the implementation of policy. And I am not being um, exceptionalist about India. I study my own society as well, and I see all this going on in the UK. And the final thing that is very common, commonly associated with the public administration view of policy, is the externality. In other words, what I mean by this is that the real world is some of the obstacles to the smooth running of policy. It's like a generalized escape hatch. And in this, Joseph Stalin and the president of the World Bank have much in common because time and time again, they are on record as, as regarding society as the sum of obstacles to the smooth running of the project. Okay, um, onwards, onwards and upwards to the um, intersection of politics and economics. Rational choice, public choice, is a very, very wide-ranging aspect of politics, which I'm sure the people who are preparing the public policy masters are going to need to pay a lot of attention to. It's very different from the economics approach um, and from public administration 101, the rational linear approach that I was just talking about. But it has a lot of relevance to the kind of conversation that I was privileged to have with your vice chancellor over breakfast this morning, um, where we were talking about corruption. Um, at its simplest, and of course this is a talk which is skating over a lot of fields which are actually quite complicated. Um, politics is invaded by economics to model policy making in quasi-market terms, with voters or lobbies as demand, with policies as commodities, and with votes as prices. Or alternatively, the state is seen as a set of self-seeking interest groups and self-serving leaders. In other words, the state is the set of politicians and bureaucrats acting rationally and maximizing the gains from office, and that they will all harm the welfare of society as a whole, the public interest, if we can conceive of that, unless somehow they are restricted. Now, this approach is often criticized, um, especially by anthropologists, as economics, well, also by some people who study politics, as economics imperialism. But it can also be understood as the result of a set of historical circumstances, um, because theories are not world historical general, but they're often historically embedded. And countries in Africa resisted structural adjustment policies um, imposed by the World Bank with conditions in the 1980s and 90s. And the question people started to ask was why, and the answer was provided through rational choice theory. So in rational choice theory, its societies are modeled in two main ways, and both explore what we know as rent-seeking. Firstly, economic agents using political markets, modeled as I just described them, for economic gain. Um, if you want an example, think of Indian election funding. Policies are then analyzed inferentially to reflect, to, to deduce or to infer the social interests that have profited. The paradigmatic book is, um, is Bates's book, which is looking at agricultural policy, markets and states in tropical Africa. Um, it's an old book now, but it's certainly not irrelevant. It stood the test of time. The second approach is to turn it round and look at the behavior of political agents using economic markets for political power. And I think the Tamil political dynasties um, exemplify this approach to rent seeking. And inferences are then made about who gains from maximizing short-term revenue, um, like, as from the tax to be spent in a particular way during an election cycle as a nutrient base for fraud by politicians and bureaucrats. And this has generated theories about predatory states and about market autocracies, because in this approach, markets are more important than is democracy. Of course, nothing occurs without opposition. So opposition is contestation, and contestation is modeled in the rational choice approach as constraints to policy implementation or to rent-seeking subversion. And the constraints are identified as political, bureaucracies, military, big business, workers, etc., etc. They can be modeled in various ways. Or technical, um, particularly lack of technical expertise or bureaucratic experience 
or resource-based lack of tax revenue, aid, loans, or various kinds of resource interference. Then in rational choice, individuals within the state can be modelled um, in, I think, three main ways. One is the combined set of politicians and voters, where a given policy maximises their staying in power. Or at least this is the way policy can be analysed through this rational choice approach. The second is the set of politicians and officials where policy creates positions inside the state which is used to benefit kin, neighbours, clients. And there's a big literature on clientelism. And the third is officials whose conduct and efficiency is analysed in terms of their incentives and disincentives. And this has given rise to a massive literature on corruption, um, to which your vice chancellor has just contributed a new book. Um, again, applications of rational choice are inferential, but they're also normatively awkward because the main policy is that the state is to abolish itself, and this kind of policy uh, is hard to implement and often resisted, and now, of course, conditioned by new management, by entrepreneurialism, by subcontracting, and commodification and the re-regulation of the state. And that may be seen as an aband abandonment of policy space, or we can see it as a redefinition of what policy might be for. Um, can I go on a bit and look at rest of politics? Yeah, sure. um, we, we can move now from looking at rational choice to looking at um, another family of approaches to policy which are called all kinds of things, historical or structural, and possibly Marxian, Marxist, Marxish approach to policy. Um, this is often also reductive in the same way as economics and politics have, have considered policy making, but in a different way. Here, policy is an epiphenomenon, and the more important question is the interests which are expressed in the control of the state. And in this kind of approach, policy expresses the accommodations between fractions of property-owning coalitions, as in the work of Pranab Badan over the years, or between property-owning coalitions, industrial and agricultural in the case of India, and the working class, um, the work of Ashok Mitra, which was first published, uh, Terms of Trade and Class Relations, is, is a very, very fine example of this approach. It has been recently reissued, so he at least thinks that it's relevant to the 21st century. And this kind of approach has pointed out the unreliability of making <clears throat> inferences from studies of single policies to answering that question about the nature of the state. Jos Moy studied food policy in two states of India and got two very different diagnoses. Um, this, uh, Peter Evans with IT got very, uh, a very similar result, that different adjacent states implementing the same policies um, w would lead to a different conclusion about the nature of the state. And a, a student of mine, Virginia Haw Horscroft, studied this dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Fiji, and she studied trade policy, and Fiji doesn't have any, but she studied trade policy practices, four of them, and each of them would have given rise to a different conclusion about the nature of the Fijian state. So as poor humans who are finite and with cognitive incapacities, we study one policy, but we draw big conclusions about the nature of the state at our peril. Um, the other way in which the, this approach to policy has made a huge contribution, which is ongoing and I think extremely interesting in relation to India, where I don't think it's been studied very much, is to look at the dynamic of capital and the commodification of the core functions of the state. By this, I don't mean the privatization debates. Uh, I, that is very relevant, um, turning public goods into private commodities through privatization. But what I'm thinking about is where policy is being outsourced to uh, think tanks, where policy, legal policies are being drafted by private legal drafting companies, where implementation is being subcontracted to quangos, where political parties' membership lists have been privatized, where funding of politi political parties is privatized, of course, 
And where even political party conferences are being organized through the private sector. And, and this whole process of disemboweling the state and making everything that can be turned into a field of profit turned into a field of profit and subcontracted out has an enormous impact on the weighting of policy which benefits business versus policy which benefits labor. And it, it affects the concepts of the public interest and it affects the capacity of the state efficiently to implement policy through a constantly reduced public sphere. Um, I've done a study of British energy policy. I was absolutely flummoxed by Tony Blair's um, claim in 2005 that Britain was the European leader in renewable energy when the statistics showed that it was one of the worst performers. Now, how could he make that statement? So I went into it, and in going into it, I got a terrible shock. I found that with respect to energy policy, the British state can't define the public interest, it can't make policy in the long-term interest, and it can't mediate between conflicting interests. And everything that can be commodified has been commodified, so that what is left is disjointed activities which highly motivated, highly intelligent civil servants find very frustrating and dissatisfying uh, to try to implement. Anyway, so I, I don't suggest India goes that way. It was the first time I saw the Indian state as a, uh, at least in its energy policy, it may be misguided and based on coal, but it's coherent. And it, India has a capacity to implement that policy, whereas the UK doesn't. I saw India in a very different light. But I believe that this process is going on everywhere. And I think it's a very interesting one to study. Okay, on to anthropology. Anthropology has made a very lagged response to the problem of policy, but as it's moved out of studying the primitive and the marginal toward using its method, which is participant observation, and towards using mixed methods to study very complex organizations and advanced society, I think that they have made three really important contributions to our understanding of policy. The first is through discourse, by which I simply mean um, regularities and language codes which are specific to certain social practices. I'm not an artifati Foucauldian. Um, it's, these are both mystifying and they're also shortcuts um, to, you, you can argue that discourses are highly efficient. Uh, not using discourses is very time consuming. <laughs> um, the contribution of anthropologists is to argue that policy sectors and development agencies generate their own discourses, that the discourse of um, uh, the commercial taxes department will be pretty unintelligible to the um, mother and child, uh, the department dealing with women's emancipation and mother and child benefits and so on and so forth. They generate their own terms of art, their own discourse, and that this creates a structure of knowledge and expertise, epistemic communities, which often fail in their own terms. Think about how um, uh, well, I, all my working life, since 1969, um, I've been engaged with literature which is dedicated to removing poverty. But we have big debates over poverty, but poverty has certainly not been removed. There is an enormous community of experts who have an interest, even if they don't declare it, in, in the fact that poverty continues not to be addressed. So while failing in their own terms have all kinds of effects, which include the entrenchment of bureaucratic power and the exclusion of alternatives and the denial of politics. The classic statement was quite some time ago by James Ferguson, who studied the World Bank in Lesotho in, in Southern Africa. And he concluded controversially that development is an anti-politics machine. But while he points out that policy threatens domestic political mobilizations by constantly depoliticizing everything that it touches and Tinaizing it. Um, he nevertheless avoids the Foucauldian question of the very real resources and politic, um, politics that is generated by this kind of development policy, forces which um, really affect distributive outcomes and are resisted. Other much debated problems with Ferguson are his discursive determinism. For him, the World Bank and its development project is homogenized, um, whereas the moment you actually work inside the World Bank, you realize that it's a, a far from homogeneous organization. And another problem is the fallacy of scaling up that he has been taken to make, to, to have been arguing a kind of world historical generalization. And that's similar to the fallacy of inferring the nature of the state from a single policy study. 
The second field in which anthropologists have made a good contribution is through labeling alongside political science, and I talked about it before. <clears throat> since all policy has to be labeled, and since the act of labeling is exclusive, anthropologists have examined how labeling has been naturalized, how we take it for granted, and how it's reasoned and seems to be very reasonable. And the key uh, contributions have been by Raymond Apthorpe and by Jeff Wood. And if anybody wants references, I can give them to them. And they've shown how the ownership of labels and the content of labels are instruments of power through which fields of power are created and maintained against challenges and through which development is sectoralized. And again, alternatives are very hard to implement. And the third contribution that they have made is through ethno ethno ethnographies and ethnographizing the policy process, conceiving it as a process. So anthropologists have studied policy through the metaphor of policy chains, which are the policy equivalent of value chains, yes, and are studied in the same way, going from Washington or Brussels or Geneva through New Delhi out to Bhopal and then into the districts of Mofasil, Madhya Pradesh, and so on and so forth. In particular, it's only through ethnographies, alongside an anal analysis of various kinds of texts, that the policy technologies which supply all the links between the discursive aspects of policy and the actual practical outcomes on the ground can be known. Um, uh, there's a very good book which is coming out shortly um, by Bina Fernandez, an Indian scholar. Um, the book is entitled A Feminist Towards a Feminist Theory of Policy. And she means feminist both in the obvious sense of uh, looking at feminist policy, looking at policy to try to develop Adivasi women. But it's also feminist in this postmodern sense, in that it is non reductionist. It's what the feminists claim to be very different from a masculine approach to policy. So that it's celebrating diversity and complexity in a very careful ethnography of the many, many policy practices which mean that the intended beneficiaries of this kind of development policy end up by being the victims or not being benefited at all. Meanwhile, there are all kinds of people benefit right down the policy chain. So she's tried to. Um, analyze these th things, classify them, and make a middle order statement about them. OK, so anthropologists have made I th what I think is a very important contribution. Um, and so has the critical aspect to public administration. Remember, I, I, I have, in fact, carved public administration into two parts, one of which I dealt with by talking when I talked about economics. And the second now, after I've talked about the contribution of anthropology, because it seems that it's easier to understand once we've unpacked policy um, to the extent that we have. Um, an enormous amount of research in um, Queen Elizabeth House, where Shrogato and Asim have, um, ha have been involved, has been of this sort. Um, its question is, is policy inevitable? What real room for manoeuvre is there? Is policy emancipating? How does policy empower people? So this question is actually a very broad one and cannot be answered so easily with the tools that the other disciplines have. So instead of a rational linear process conceived as a line or perhaps as a circle with monitoring and evaluation, it's, uh, the critical approach to public administration sees policy perhaps as four wheels moving simultaneously, um, gyrating and seething with politics. The first process, it's, so, so policy is actually very complicated, and we do it no justice if we try to simplify it. We need to understand its complexity and take its complexity seriously. So Bernard Schaffer, um, who, with whom this approach originated, who um, seemed to have been following parallel grounds to Foucault, but completely independently, because he's got his inspiration from working in the bureaucracy of Australia, not um, from um, cafes in Paris. Um, he sees policy processes four, fourfold. The first is the process of making a policy agenda. Um, and this is also understood by Foucauldians as the representation of policy. It's the politics whereby statements of intention are announced. And these can be many and varied. Manifestos, project proposals for funding, five-year plans, 
mission statements, vision statements, the policy relevant part of policy relevant research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, the politics whereby uh, their language is determined, their labels and their themes are determined, and the uh, list of priorities is, is somehow hammered out. So this is actually very complicated business by itself, in which a lot of the policy discussion and analysis that I've previous talk, previously talked about here is relevant, but much more besides. There is the open process of the media, there is party political debate, there are the activities of NGOs and social movements, all of, it, of which are above board. But there's also a hidden process of policy making through bribes, coercion, and lobbying, which is not visible. It's absolutely hidden. But we ignore this at our peril. Very often we can't explain why it is that certain policies become very important without the hidden aspects of agenda formation. After agenda, there is procedure. Procedure is a, a broader con concept than law, but it actually refers to law. It's the power relations, the politics that give rise to law, to rules, to informal norms, together with the politics of the control of the slippage between forming the agenda and enshrining it in law and in legal resources. And these resources, these need to be seen, procedure needs to be seen as a resource with all kinds of um, enterprising attempts to capture it and to deploy it strategically. Thirdly, there is access to the state, access to the results of the policy process. And here, Bernard Schaffer um, devised a theory of cues. He saw policy as something happening across a boundary between the state and civil society, so that that boundary was theorized as a counter, beyond which people were queuing up in certain orders according to rules and practices of eligibility and cues and their disciplines, as well as the possibility for exit option, options for getting access to those resources by illegitimate means or for the deployment of voice. And um, Asim Prakash's work on Dalits and their particular access to the state and to policy process shows very, very clearly how um, these things are highly specific to different parts of Indian society and different policy fields. Um, missing from Schaffer's analysis is the politics of resource mobilization. And most studies of policy don't really look at banking and finance and how, how the money chain is structured that enables policy to be enacted and to be implemented. And I think this is something that's missing in an awful lot of policy studies and that it, you would all be well advised to think about how you will teach um, the mobilization of resources to make policies possible. Because if you don't include this in policy analysis or policy advocacy, nothing will happen because the money to do it won't be there. And almost all policy studies also um, miss out the political econ economic context. Um, Bina Fernandez, in, in order to study this paradox of Ad Adivasi women in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra, why were they victims instead of beneficiaries? She had to go all the way back to the five-year plans and study the evolution of the treatment of women and of Adivasis in the five-year plans. I'm at my final lap. Um, no policy can be implemented without law or without procedure. Two aspects of law are particularly re relevant to an understanding of development policy as a political process. Well, there may be more aspects, but in my teaching of policy, I've come across these two as being particularly useful. One is the law and development approach, in which law and legal engineering was conceived as able to determine the course of development and actually to reform and change society, politics, and the economy in developing countries. In other words, law was an instrument ex ante to other kinds of policy. This was the, the law was the parameter within which developmental things took place and was ex ante and not ex post. And USAID put huge money into this approach to development in the 1960s in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America, and used professors from Yale, Harvard, Stanford, and Wisconsin.
And after 10 years, um, this project collapsed. It collapsed for very interesting reasons, um, which are reflected on in a great long paper called Lawyers in Self-Estrangement by Trubeck and Galanta, which is in the Wisconsin Law Review of 1974. But really, it's not a dinosaur document. It, it's worth reading in the 21st century for reasons that I'll get to next. There was no theory. Um, there was the uh, implied aim to recruit lawyers to do development work. Um, the law that was transferred um, was not necessarily very relevant. Instead of legally determined social change, what happened was the development of a plurality of systems of law. Law became evidently a, um, a resource for capture, as I explained um, in the Shafirian approach to public policy. Law was completely unable to be used to redistribute resources. So the project was abandoned, um, and abandoned for many decades, only to see it revived recently and applied uh, and emerging in Iraq where law is being used again to create the parameters for development, but with a huge difference. Whereas the 1960s project, which lasted about 10 years and resulted in all kinds of, as it were, um, pathologies of law and development instead of a legally driven process, whereas that was state conceived, the uh, use of law and development and the revisiting of this concept in Iraq is uh, a market concept of uh, a, a use of law to develop the parameters, the legal frameworks for a market-based process of development. And I suppose all we can hope is that it's not as catastrophic as the, the, the state-driven um, process. And the final big contribution that law, law and sociology of law has made to our understanding of policies, understanding legal pluralism, in which, I mean, <clears throat> modernity is defined more or less in terms of the passage from the rule of custom to the rule of contract. But in so many countries, custom and contract coexist. And uh, we have to conceive the normative framework of all kinds of activity, including a lot of the economy in India, um, as regulated in a dual way, in a legally pluralistic system, by both custom and by contract. Um, and the sociologists of law who've explored legal pluralism, see um, custom and contract not as alternatives, but as things which are locked together and intertwined and chosen and deployed strategically. Um, and the key re uh, research on this theme is actually carried out in Indonesia rather than India, and it is um, a Dutch sociologist of law called Franz von Bender Beckman, who has carried out the seminal work on legal pluralism. Okay, so I end there. It's very tempting to write about policy, especially if you're in a public policy school. But every way you write about policy embodies assumptions. And when you write about policy in one way, you're often not writing about policy in another way. So a school of government and a public policy, such as the one that you're conceiving here, has, I believe, a very, very fine opportunity to range creatively in your teaching and your own research and your policy advocacy over an enormous territory. Thank you.